Hello, everyone. My name is Mehdi Kalaji. I'm a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. In roughly two months, the Islamic Republic of Iran will celebrate the 40th anniversary of its founding in Tehran. Since its inception, the regime of the Belayat al-Faqih, or the Guardian Jurist, has brutally crushed the decent and employed anti-Americanism as the guiding principle in its uncompromising foreign policy. The international community, responding through a combination of both appeasement and pressure, has been distinctly unsuccess unsuccessful in prompting a change in Tehran's regional behavior. And no opposition movement has thus far emerged to threaten the viability of the regime. Today, the Washington Institute for Near East Policy is pleased to host former Crown Prince Reza Pahlavi, the son of Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi, to discuss the current state of regime in Tehran and the prospect for political change. Mr. Pahlavi is a prominent opposition figure and has consistently called for, the, for replacing Iran's current regime with a secular liberal democracy. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Pahlavi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Khalaji, for your introduction. <clears throat> I'm very happy to be here today, and I express my gratitude to the Washington Institute for hosting this discussion. Organizations like the Washington Institute continue to play a critical role in advancing scholarship and understanding regarding the modern Middle East. Their contributions to the formulation of foreign policy can be particularly meaningful, especially during the more sensitive and turbulent periods in our region. I would like to begin by invoking a popular protest slogan that is heard often these days in universities, factories, mosques, and streets across Iran. I quote my compatriots. Our enemy is right here. They lie when they say it's America. Perhaps no other rallying cry communicates more effectively Iran's wholesale rejection of the Islamic Republic. From its inception in 1979, the Islamic Republic sought to subvert Iran in order to advance its own ideological, economic, and security interests. It changed our century-old flag and suppressed our ancient traditions. It purged our universities and persecuted or killed our artists. It institutionalized inequality and discrimination based on religion and gender. It destroyed the very soil, air, and water that comprises Iran in the physical sense. And it plundered voraciously, stealing our people's private property, appropriating major Iranian businesses, and siphoning off revenue for trade in our natural, natural, natural resources. With wealth taken from the Iranian people, the regime worked to spread its brand of hate and destruction throughout our region and to cause instability and conflict worldwide. It established paramilitary organizations and other non-state actors to serve as proxies for the destabilization and subversion of our neighbors. It threatened the world with a dubious nuclear program. It fomented and prolonged sinister wars that have left hundreds of thousands of Muslims dead and made millions of others refugees. And it both sponsored and conducted terrorism killing countless innocents in the Middle East, Europe, South America, and the United States. Thankfully, its two most recent known foreign terror attempts were uncovered and prevented in Europe. The Islamic Republic took our land and our nation hostage. 
at least until now, it has survived, but only through fear, repression, and violence. But Iran and Iranians have had enough. In the face of seemingly insurmountable obstacles and untold risks, the Iranian people have opened a new era of opposition to the regime. In towns and cities across Iran, every day, they are confronting it tirelessly and courageously. Through public protests, labor strikes, and innumerable acts of civil disobedience, they are expressing their rejection of its every principle, element, and faction. They want their freedom, their dignity, and their country back. To the international community, the promise of my compatriots' movement represents a historic opportunity to achieve an enduring solution to the numerous threats emanating from the Islamic Republic. In fact, this is an opportunity to transform the Middle East because a democratic Iran will be representative of its people and a representative a representative Iran will be a very different force outside its borders. Consider whether a democratic Iran would promote Shiite revolutionary politics, prop up terrorist organizations like Hezbollah, Hamas, or the Houthis, facilitate the shameful mass murdering of innocent Syrians or Yemenis, or threaten Israel with destruction. Of course not. A representative Iranian government will reflect the culture of Iran and the feelings and aspiration of its people. Envision an Iran that works closely with its Arab neighbors to stamp out terrorism and extremism in the region. That welcomes Israeli scientists to help with its water crisis. That embraces American and European investment in the boundless potential of its economy that shares its most brilliant minds with the great centers of learning and development in the West, that exports its dazzling art and beautiful music, and that honors its country's spirit of love and tradition of friendship towards foreign nations. Again, I point to the actions and words of my compatriots. In universities in Iran, Students sidestep or leap over American and Israeli flags painted on the ground. This is both a remarkable rebuck towards the regime and a moving illustration of Iranian goodwill. In their protest, my compatriots chant, Syria and Palestine are the reason for our misery. Leave Syria alone, think instead of conditions at home. Neither for Gaza nor for Lebanon, I die only for Iran. And we may die, we may die, but we will reclaim Iran. For almost 40 years, I have worked towards a single objective, a secular democratic Iran built upon the pillars of human rights and the rule of law. I have insisted that the Islamic Republic poses an existential threat to Iran and its people and that the Islamic Republic cannot be reformed. I have been steadfast in my belief that a secular democratic Iran may be achieved only through nonviolent means. And I have been unwavering in my faith that the Iranian people can and will be the principal agent of this change. But international attention and support remains critical. Dr. Martin Luther King is one of my personal heroes. As I work to build international support for the Iranian people's struggle, I often recall his famous covenant that we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. In that vein, I want to make clear that the Iranian struggle should not be viewed through the prism of domestic partisan politics in this or any other democratic nation. This is a struggle about human dignity and liberation, and it deserves equal and unqualified support across the democratic political spectrum. At no time in its almost 40-year history has the Islamic Republic been 
as unpopular and vulnerable as it is today. Foreign policy towards Iran should be mindful of the reality that my compatriots are presently in the throes of a national struggle to reclaim Iran from the Islamic Republic. My focus is on guiding this process of change so that its outcome is secular, democratic, and lasting. Thank you very much. Thank you again for accepting our invitation and giving us this opportunity to discuss with you uh, further these issues. Um, uh, first, let's start with the uh, anniversary of the Islamic Republic, which is going to be in about two months. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini was understanding. Uh, hmm? Sorry. I apologize. You can go ahead. Yeah. Um, Ayatollah Khomeini, I, I think uh, many people agree that he was an uh, outstanding leader in, in uh, converging all uh, political uh, dissidents and opposition groups uh, who were working against the regime of Shah and uh, led the revolution, and he succeeded. After 40 years, what kind of lessons can be drawn from his experience as a political leader? Someone wants to be a political leader and change the regime now. Well, first of all, I, I think you cannot compare what the circumstances and climate was. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, I don't know. Is, there, is that better? I don't know. Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's not forget also that one of the key factors that transcended the individual was the element of religion. Something that, despite 14 centuries of the Islamic religion in our country, was not quite understood the way people understand it now. It had to come to an actual inquisition, this time of the Islamic kind, for people to understand the importance of secularism in the context of separation of religion from governance as a prerequisite to democracy and equality. And insofar as Khomeini did, in fact, bring in an ideology and political Islam, as opposed to what the faith really was supposed to be like or is supposed to be like, and after 40 years of suffering under this dominant religious ideology, I think Iranians today are at the end of the tunnel and uh, think that what will bring us to an era of change is not just the work of a few individuals, but it takes a whole village, so to speak, to bring this about. I think Iranians today, particularly when I look at the younger generation, are far more proactive in the sense of knowing that in order to achieve anything, you can no longer seek back and expect one person or one ent entity all by itself to do everything. It takes the whole lot of us to bring about this change. And if there are some leaders who play every now and then roles in terms of leadership and guidance, which of course is necessary, it is certainly helpful, but it is not only limited to that. So Khomeini was able to, back then, basically be the agent of contradiction to the status quo. The opposition thought at the time, let's get rid of the Shah, then see what happens. What we say today, among those of us who are discussing the future of Iran, is to say that this is not just enough to say we don't want this regime anymore. But what do we want instead? This time understanding fully what it is we want to achieve, what it will take to achieve that, and most importantly, and as you all know, Iran is very diverse in terms of its political spectrum, left, right, monarchists, republicans, federalists, what have you. But one thing is very certain, the majority are secular democrats, and they understand that today our job is to figure out what's more important, our priority in terms of our national interest, 
that is the common denominator of all these uh, uh, diverse groups, which is why we can work together in unity, or is it going to be the game that the regime has tried to impose on us all these years and force the secondary issue of ideological debate between a particular aspiration versus the other, forgetting about the most important issue of our national interest. This is what it's all about. So back then, nobody was worried about participation. It was just, let's get rid of this regime. Nobody knew what the Islamic regime is supposed to be like. And by the time they realized, guess what? It was too late. This time, we want to go there clearly, uh, using our own political historic uh, experience, as well as other countries that finally overcame the hurdle of dealing with totalitarian or authoritarian systems, and understanding what is the benefit of replacing it and with what, and why is it that we have to be committed to it? So yes, I think today the situation uh, requires the participation of a multitude of uh, actors, players. We each have our role to play, including yours truly. You talked about the ideology. Um, the uh, ideology of um, Islamic ideology is similar to communism in the fact that um, the communism was an idea which was born in Europe, but it was realized in Russia. The idea of Islamic Republic or Islamic government was born in Egypt by Muslim Brotherhood, but it was realized in Tehran, in Iran, in a country that is proud of its pre-Islamic civilization and identity. Why is that? How do you explain that? Well, I think Iran was um, the best platform for, for, for launching this missile that was thrown at the free world by, by, by Khomeini against the interests of the Iranian people and our immediate neighbors and the world uh, uh, around. Uh, he could have done it from Tunis, he could have done it from Syria, he could have done it even from Iraq, but Iran presented at the time uh, all the means necessary to, uh, uh, to be, uh, unfortunately, at the service of this uh, imposed ideology. But I, I want to say something here that I think is more important for the, all of us today to understand. Uh, something that around the world remains the same obvious issue. The dominance of any ideology exclusively, whether religious or otherwise, is a recipe for disaster. We saw it in the case of communism in the Soviet Union. We clearly see it in the case of Iran. I often tell our Muslim friends in the region, how do you explain that Muslims are much freer living in countries like Canada and the United States than they are in their own so-called Muslim countries. What's the element that is different here? The answer is simple. A guarantee by the Constitution of freedom of religion as one of the liberties that people have. That doesn't exist in Iran today. Today, if you're a Baha'i, you can't study. If you convert to Christianity, they'll execute you. Uh, you don't even have the basic uh, circumstances where a Sunni Baluchi or Kurd can have his own mosque to pray in. There's discrimination of the worst possible kind, and we can start by women to begin with, and so many others. And when people look at all of this, whether it is their ethnicity, whether it's their religious beliefs, whether it is their sexual orientation or political ideology, what is going to give the Iranian people in the future a guarantee of equality under the law? And eliminating any form of discrimination while guaranteed maximum participation. It can only be a secular democratic system, period. And that's why today people gravitate around why we need to get rid of this regime and why you cannot attain democracy without putting an end to this regime. Besides the freedom of religion, what do you mean exactly by, by secularism? Because the Pahlavi dynasty is known for its uh, distinct um, secularization program, you know, since Reza Shah Pahlavi. Um, and we saw this backlash from society and the emergence of Islamic Republic and, you know, um, establishment of um, Islamic uh, Republic. So what do you think uh, a good secularism could be? in future Iran? Uh, I think it's important for those who have religious aspirations, I mean, I mean, they're devout Muslims, let's say, or, or for that matter, any other faith, but in this case, uh, Muslims, that being secular doesn't mean you're anti-religious. Did Europe lose its Christianity after the Inquisition? Of course not. But secular values, guarantees of equality and non-discrimination, 
cannot be done when one religious ideology thinks that it has superiority over another faith or another belief. It, it, it goes without saying. And that's what people have learned under this regime. If you talk to people today in Rome, if you talk to traditional clerics who were never part of this regime, if you talk to people like Ayatollah Sistani, their narrative will be very different than what Khomeini tried to impose on Iran, and for that matter, in the Islamic world. So I don't think that even within our religious establishment, the traditional clergy has any misunderstanding that in fact, and particularly in the case of Shiism, there cannot be any governance of religion or religious elements. In fact, it goes against the very talent of Shiism if you study it well. The only people who are supposed to be representative of God on earth are supposed to be the ma'asums. In other words, people who haven't committed any sins. And we know there are only five of them, according to Islamic belief. And they're not around, by the way. <laughs> so uh, let's go to the 21st century of, of where Iran could be. The, the, exp the, the, the secularization and modernization of Iran is something that people today, when they compare to where we are, see that the, what, what created an obstacle and rewound the clock way back into the Dark Ages has been the appearance of this so-called religious government. That in fact, Iran could have realized all of its potentials had it not been for a revolution that first and foremost executed so many people who worked, had worked tirelessly to build that country, forced a massive exodus and brain drain of people who were immediately persecuted because they were a member of the previous regime or because they were Jewish or because they were uh, homosexual or what have you. And Iran today should be like South Korea at the very least, but instead we have become North Korea. Uh, is it because we lack the resources? Is it because we lack the human potential and ingenuity? For God's sake, Iranians are running half of the show in most foreign countries that they have become citizens in. Look at America alone. Why aren't they not back in Iran? Why don't they have an opportunity today to help their country be the best it could be? It goes back to this very element and obstacle that is impunitively discriminating. And I have no doubt that the minute the situation changes, everything that has meaning for the people on the streets, I'm not talking about an intelligentsia debate of the value and merits and philosophical debates about democracy and human rights that we all know. But to the man on the street, to that worker who hasn't been paid his salary for the past six months, for people who today have to sell their organs in order to survive, they understand that this potential for Iran's economic recovery and well beyond that cannot happen while you still have this regime. So yes, if you are a good student of what actually happens to us, I think the, the light at the end of the tunnel would show that Iran this time will understand the virtue of secularism, not just because they happen to have two modern thinking monarchs who in their era did whatever they could, which is why they're chanting their names today in good memories, but also because they realize that without which our society will not progress. And this is a demand that I can sense uh, every single day as I talk to my fellow compatriots. And yes, we will absorb also the fact that we can be modern and secular without having to lose our tradition, including our various religious uh, traditions. Your father was a secular Shah too, but he was calling himself the king of Shia because the monarchy in Iran, even in pre-Islamic Iran, was getting its legitimacy from religion. So there was an alliance between clerical establishment and the monarchy institutions. So if you become the king of Iran, what would be the source of legitimacy for that? Well, again, uh, we cannot compare what happened a century ago during the Constitutional Revolution, because if you follow it more closely, you know that when we had uh, an amendment to the Iranian constitution a year following the drafting of the first constitution, some kind of compromise was reached with the religious establishment to try to preserve this newly brought about constitutional system against an absolute monarchy. And the unfortunate compromise was to allow for the five mujtahids to be sitting in parliament and ruling over whether or not certain laws and legislation would be compatible with Sharia law and what have you. Which again, is the beginning of where there's a flaw in separation from church and state. But do you think that the kind of secular arguments and debates Iranians have today in Iran or outside beyond the breaking of the taboos of talking about religion existed at the time? 
Of course not. When my father tried to bring in emancipation of women and their full participation in their own system, when we brought land reforms in order to put an end to feudalism and elements such as this, who were the first elements that resisted these changes? It was the clerical establishment, including Khomeini. Did people then understand the importance of having to stand up to the clergy? No. And oddly enough, when people say Reza Shah Ruhat Shah, meaning my grandfather, it's because he was so tough vis-a-vis -vis the clergy. But do we have to use the same means to achieve the same ends today? No. I think it has to be built in our collective national psyche and appreciation of democratic governance. And the guarantee and the rule of law is ultimately what the Constitution prescribes. And I have always said that I believe that it is the Constitution that defines us, that regulates us, that governs over us. And that's the choice the Iranian people will be able to make once we are rid of this regime, so that those in charge of drafting the future constitution will build in all these safeguards. And I believe that we certainly should have our constitution based on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because in one shot, it will be dealing with so many issues that our society had had to face for centuries, including the modern era, as it relates to children's rights, to women's rights, to ethnics, to whatever it is under the rainbow that we can think of, built in as a guarantee. So it's not by virtue of legitimacy claimed by one individual with some kind of an arrangement, with some uh, particular uh, governing ideology. No, I think we should, we have reached a stage, I dare say that, as modern Iran could be in the future, that we are not have a, uh, an official religion, that we are not have an official anything. The rule of law should guarantee any Iranians to have the liberty of his or her beliefs, as long as their beliefs is not imposed on any uh, other person. It's just basically pluralism and a respect for agreeing to have uh, diversity among ourselves. What unites us and guarantees us, each single one of us, whether we are uh, uh, Turk or Arab or Kurd or Baluch or, 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 or Muslim or, or Christian or atheist or straight or gay, everything will be guaranteed by the rule of law. That should be what establishes the guarantees. Not one individual, not one institution, but the law of the land. Let me ask the last question about the past and then go to the future. Uh, you've been um, 17 years old when revolution happened. Um, yes. And uh, <coughs> since your father passed away, you become the head of the family. Uh, you became uh, politically active while the other members of family uh, were not that much active, especially the women in your family are not politically active. You're, you have three daughters, your wife, and even the queen did not play a bold political activity, uh, um, uh, role in the last 40 years. Uh, first, why women in your family are not politically active? And second, how do you assess your record in the last 40 years while you didn't um, you know, create a political party or a political organization or even uh, some kind of foundation or uh, institution? Well, you know, I'm glad you're asking this question because I think a lot of people have yet to fully understand what is actually my role. Um, I have some kind of a historical meaning in terms of someone who need not take a political position or advocate a particular ideology or political system of thinking in order to be known. Uh, which is why I say my role is first and foremost not political. My role is to be able to help a diverse set of political ideologies to understand the priority that we face today about the commonality interests of a democratic Iran in the future. I don't have to take a position on whether somebody is a socialist or somebody is a conservative or he is a monarchist or he's a republican or he's a federalist or a centrist or what have you. That's not my role. My role, however, is to help as much dialogue and as much unity of purpose to what is today our first and foremost priority, liberating our homeland. There'll be ample time to debate, and that's not my cup of tea. Political parties will form, they will debate policy, as a result, governments will be formed, uh, the composition of parliament will be changed, as we've seen in this country over the midterm elections, for instance. 
that's like in any other democratic country. And therefore, it is not my role to take political position. And by virtue of that understanding, you should not expect any members of my family to do this either. On the other hand, we could be advocate on many subjects that touches uh, Iranian society today. My daughters, the way they can, my wife, the way she can, my mother, the way she did, and she still can. We are here to assist and to help and to support our compatriots. Uh, and at the end of the day, if you're talking about what future form Iran uh, uh, will have, again, that's something that the Iranian people will have to decide. From the day I started this struggle after my father passed away when I was in Cairo, I made it a life's mission and set a limit and, an, uh, and, a, uh, and a finish line for myself as my sole and only political goal, to help Iran be liberated from this current regime. I saw it maybe earlier than others. Some people finally have tuned in and realized that reform is unattainable. And therefore, today, many former reformists are converging with us who, from the beginning, uh, were advocating a secular system versus a, a religious dictatorship to get to that point and let the people of Iran in a truly atmosphere of free and fair election decide their fate. The day, and I've said it for 38 years and I will continue saying this, the day Iranians go to the poll to make that decision, I will consider that mission accomplished in life. So that's what my function has been all these years. I've been in dialogue with a variety of political groups inside outside of Iran and trying to see how we can preserve that uh, priority in our minds appreciating and respecting our diverse viewpoints, but understanding that the only time we can benefit from the rights to differ is when we are struggling for the same cause of a liberty without which we won't be able to have these debates and differences. That's why we have to give uh, uh, hold hands and, and, and get this done, because our country is at stake, our future is at stake, and I think it, it behooves those of us who have any kind of moral impact or political influence in people's thinking and actions to remind them of the priority and what is in our best national interest. And that's exactly what is the tug of war and the, the, the basic conflict that I've had with this regime. Our prioritizing national issues and the regime trying to force Iranians to fight among each other to try to basically forget about what the uh, commonality of interest is. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, how I will uh, ask you to understand what my role is. Not being a political one, but one more that is uh, above the fray and neutral and trying to bring as many elements to work together for a common cause. But you initiated uh, some dialogue between um, opposition groups in the past, and almost all of them failed. Why do you think this time it would succeed? And uh, this is one question. The other question is that every um, revolution needs um, financial resources. Ayatollah Khomeini was a merger. He was getting religious taxes from uh, people. And uh, you know, in the 70s, with the rise of um, oil price, um, there were lots of money injected into the market. And the money from market went to the Khomeini's pocket, and he overthrown the regime. So is there, beside the political elite, which seem to uh, keep distance from you, uh, do you think that there is an economic class that they support you and they support the cause of regime change in Iran? Well, the premise of your question is not uh, totally accurate. I mean, I've, as I said, I've had dialogues over the years with numerous uh, representatives of various political groups or orientations, both at home and abroad. It, it has only increased over the last few years, in particularly the last couple of years, because again, let's not forget one thing. Until only a couple of years ago, half of the nation, no matter how disenchanted they were with the system, would still put some faith in the current Iranian administration to maybe bring about something. But for the past two years, you can ask any Iranian that is monitoring closely, and I'm sure there are many in this room who do that professionally every day. I'm sure you have noticed how different the read on the streets are as opposed to two years ago. It's a different ball game. And sometimes you have to have circumstances uh, be available in more than just one category for something to successfully happen. Um, it is not enough just to have an organized opposition. Uh, 
It is not only enough to have protesters in the streets without political leadership. It is not enough only to have an entente without no international support. There are many elements that have to happen at the same time for something to happen. I mean, if NASA was going to give up when they launched their first rocket and it failed and not try it again, we would not be where we are today. And in politics, sometimes you have to try and try again. The difference is that today we all know that not rising up to the challenge is contributing to a post-regime state of chaos. That's really where the bad news is. I'm not worried about whether this regime will, will collapse or not. That's a given. What we ought to worry about is are we going to be facing a controlled implosion with a recipe of a secular uh, outcome as opposed to the remnants of SEPA thinking that like in the post-Soviet Union collapse, there will be a state of anarchy and they will have a justifiable, this time, necktie-wearing dictators as opposed to turban-wearing dictators. But at the end, it's still controlling the national resources of the country, but not in the interest of the general population. You mentioned also something very interesting. Look, we have been seeing a policy that included economic sanctions on Iran, and yes, the Iranian people have suffered, but so has the regime. But in the area of constructive assistance, not much has really been done. Right now, as we speak, we have elements that are representatives or, 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 or financially or by virtue of family relations linked to this regime who are roaming freely, including in America. And there are many resources and assets that the regime has plundered in Iran that have reinvested to their own gains that could be frozen and controlled and given to the hand of, in fact, the democratic forces instead of being at the control of the regime. Talking about creating wealth when there's no wealth within Iran. There are so many areas where misplaced funding can do harm as opposed to the right targeted sanctions that could help us. During the previous administration, what happened? Almost $1.7 billion in cash was given to the regime doing bad job. Was it spent on the Iranian workers? Would it spend on Iranian schools? No. It probably ended up in Syria or elsewhere. These are the kind of questions that the opposition is asking where it comes to resources that could be made available. And potentially it exists. It doesn't come from thin air. But these are elements where it properly utilized or properly vested would be the difference between the regime continuing to plunder the nation and sustain itself as opposed to making a move that would be I think very seriously monitored and encouraged by Iranian dissidents at home and abroad that finally we're getting the help we really need. Despite the regime censorship when it comes to social media, despite the regime putting economic pressure on the people, despite their means to uh, control or to influence or to infiltrate uh, foreign based media that is broadcasting programming into Iran, let's see where the real changes are happening. Otherwise, giving Iranian people lip service that we are with you, but not doing anything constructive to actually help them, is going to be yet another false promise and disillusionment will follow. So we have an opportunity here to control the outcome by making sure that it doesn't end in the wrong hands. But it doesn't happen by itself. You have to make an, a, a decisive choice of working with the actual forces that represents change. Let me give you a very final, simple example. D during the period that led to the ultimate collapse of the Soviet Union, beyond the Soviet Union itself, it was not without working directly with, uh, with movements such as Solidarity in Poland, uh, such as uh, individuals such as Vaclav Havel, for instance, in, 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 uh, in Czechoslovakia, or, or for that matter, uh, the ANC and Mandela when it came to South Africa. It was a direct engagement with the forces of change not limited dialogue only with the regime and its representatives, and hoping that you can get answers to the problem from people who are part of the problem, as opposed to also those who can be part of the solution. So these are the areas where we need to go beyond just uh, analysis of uh, you know, the topography of Iran and, 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 and where people are today. There are constructive way, and I hope that this will be taken into account by decisions that foreign governments are making today is how do they cope with the situation as we are facing more and more implosion by the regime. However, everybody's holding their breath. What can happen next? Well, if we don't address it, if we don't work the problem, 
you know, we, 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 it's a recipe for disaster. We come back to the role of the foreign countries. Uh, the um, picture you uh, provide us about the existing situation in Iran seem very, uh, seems very uh, optimistic. I think uh, you portray Iran as if Iran is in a pre-revolution uh, condition. While uh, there is a big difference bet uh, between what we see now in Iran and what we saw in Iran uh, in last years of Shah. Uh, first of all, uh, the beneficiaries of the Islamic Republic consist millions of people of millions of people in Iran. On the other hand, the repressive machinery of Islamic Republic is quite working. You know, despite all this sporadic uh, protest since last winter, we see that uh, the Iranian government was able to. Uh, control everything. Uh, so why do you think that the government is living, uh, uh, is facing a fatal crisis, which makes it uh, vulnerable be, uh, in the face of opposition's effort? Well, let me sure I understood what you said correctly, that the situation in Iran, in terms of being revolutionary, uh, you're suggesting that it is not existent because there is repression? Yeah, I mean, Iran, the, the government seems very self-confident in first in, in, in oppressing the, the opposition and um, actually having control over all this, you know, sporadic, uh, you know, uh, protest that's happening here and there. And uh, in its foreign policy, why do you think that Islamic Republic is so vulnerable before, you know, uh, in the face of the uh, efforts made by um, opposition or despite all the foreign pressure? Well, I think this would be a first if we began to believe that oppression is a sign of confidence. <laughs> it's working. I think oppression is a sign of complete insecurity. If this regime was so confident, what would it allow a Vahid Nasiri to die in jail? Why would it be afraid to allow Iranians hear the news and have free access to the internet and not filter various popular uh, uh, platforms such as Instagram or Telegram? This is not a sign of confidence. That's a sign of losing control and more oppression means we don't have an answer for it. No, I think that in fact we are very close to the state of uh, explosion, but there are some ingredients that have yet to be utilized in order for us to, in fact, take the next step to, towards a transition from this regime to the next. And the most important component in all this is, yes, the role that the military and paramilitary forces could play in this transition. Which is why one of my messages has been very specific to elements of military or paramilitary elements that you can be part of the solution, that you need not go down with this ship, that Iranians cannot hope to achieve freedom on the basis of violence and hatred and revenge, which is why I've been an advocate of civil disobedience and nonviolence, as opposed to vigilantism and taking picking up arms and killing a few basijis or pastors and not expect that the children of those people will one day come and murder your children, and therefore it's an endless cycle of violence and we will never achieve stability and security. But to say that yes, there will be a place for somebody who today is a revolutionary guard or is a Basij, who is as disillusioned as the rest of us are, that there will be a future for them, and there should be. There should be a place for them. They should know that the first elements that can guarantee the stability and security of Iran are in fact people like themselves. But do they want to be members of a newly established dictatorship against the people? Or be in fact there to help their people, be their shield, so that a Bashar Assad style genocide doesn't happen in Iran against the opposition. That in fact, it is with the people that they can defend them from last remnants or last desperate attempts by the regime to crack down on the opposition. As we speak, this is happening. At least I am privy to it on the basis of direct communication that I'm having more and more every day with representatives of the military paramilitary forces. And at some point, 
when the people on the streets know that these are people will no longer accept to do the dirty job for the regime, that in fact they'll be on their side, they'll be more heartened. At that point, the Iranian middle class and intelligentsia will understand, maybe now the risk reward warrants us to take more risks and join with the silent protesters on the streets so we facilitate this transition. That Santiago moment is going to happen. We are very close to it. Let me ask you the last question before I open the floor to um, Q&A. Um, uh, what kind of um, policy you think, especially Trump administration, uh, can take uh, in order to support the democratic movement or so-called democratic movement if uh, ever exists uh, in Iran? Well, messaging is very important. Communication is a vital key and daily need for coordination and communication of Iranians between themselves and with the outside world. Uh, one thing that could certainly be helpful is to uh, tell uh, all these uh, medias that are supposedly broadcasting programs to Iran to take the Hippocratic Oath, meaning first do no harm. Uh, these are agencies that American taxpayers or British taxpayers have been funding, but basically have been heavily penetrated by reform reform reformist elements that are basically there to support the regime. That's something as a matter of policy you could change instantly. That's one aspect. Number two, as I said, is the freezing of the assets of elements that are well known by the regime to the benefit of supporting instead forces within Iran who definitely need help. Because let's not forget something. The price that Iranian demonstrators are paying today is extremely high, not just because they may lose their jobs or in fact their lives, but their families, their wives, their children are at stakes, or their husbands. And they cannot just go on forever fighting, not knowing there will be some kind of uh, resources helping them and assisting them. Uh, a rechanneling of, uh, 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 of these issues and a revisiting of exception to certain elements of sanctions that have been blanketly punitive and it's really be like, like fishing, you know, sometimes when you do tuna fishing, you catch some dolphins in the nets. How do you separate the bad guys from the good guys? That has to be rethought a little bit more. Um, and of course, there are so many other issues, but it would take too much time for me to, to, to rehash. So I think media is one aspect, working with the dissidents and, and, and political organization, and above all, a request that I hear every single day. One of the things that my fellow competitors ask me to say every chance I get, including a meeting like this one, is let the world know what we're going through. And by the way, I brought a list here, which is just a, 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 a sample of uh, all sorts of links uh, that, you, that especially me, member of the media, I hardly encourage you to, to go out there. We, this is not, at the time I was in Cairo, where I remember the first message I sent was, was a telex machine. There were no such things like iPhones that you could turn on in the middle of a desert and get you know, all sorts of uh, uh, platforms and uh, instant messaging, what have you. Today, the world, particularly the media, that can, cannot claim that we are, don't know what's happening in Iran. There's so much abundance of information out there. The analysis of this information and what people want will tell you pretty much what is their expectation, and for that matter, what they expect foreign governments to do for them. In today's Iran, Iranians know full well that fighting this regime would be much more difficult without foreign support, without foreign governments helping. And yes, we are not at all frazzled by the idea of getting foreign support because that doesn't mean interfering or imposing a future for Iranians. We say, help us liberate ourselves with no caveat and no strings attached. We want to have our self-determination, and it has happened before in history where countries have been liberated without people having a, a, a price to pay in terms of foreign dom uh, domination of, of one form or the other. I think democratic countries, Today, America is perhaps the most important one of them, can decide whose side they're on. During the Green Movement, what was the leading slogan in Iran? People were saying, Obama, Obama, are you with us or with them? What does that mean? That means do something. Take a position. And when the answer was, we don't want to interfere in your domestic politics, it was a bucket of ice water on the head of so many people during that time and that generation. Do we want yet another generation to come to the streets to chant slogans, 
in English and in French and foreign languages, they're not practicing their linguistic skills. <laughs> they're sending you a clear message. And as long as we understand that it will take that kind of intervention, and intervention is different than interference. I'm talking about assistance and support. I hardly think that we will be able to get that level of engagement that the country needs to the detriment of the nation and to the benefit of the opportunists. On the other hand, if there's actual dialogue, for the first time in 40 years, official government dialogue with representatives of the Iranian secular democratic opposition in home and abroad, as opposed to limiting dialogue only with the regime and its representatives, then I think we'll get much quicker to an answer to how to resolve the problem and how can we work jointly, those of us fighting with freedom, with respective foreign governments, irrespective of the administration in play. This is something that is part of the expectation and if I were today talking to anybody in the White House or at state or, or, or Congress, my message hasn't changed. It has always been the same. Talk to the people who are your, uh, uh, how can I say, your uh, natural allies. Because the strategic interest of this country and that of Iran is one of the same. As opposed to this regime, which is completely the opposite of it. So have a dialogue for a change with those of us who happen to advocate the same interest that is in your strategic advantage as opposed to those who from the get-go were against it. The time has come for that. That's part of the expectation that all of us have. And I think that there are enough people in this world who will understand that this is an opportunity not to be missed. And I hope that we will achieve that. Thank you very much. Now we can ask audience to ask their questions. Uh, please. Uh, please, 30 seconds and no statement. Patrick? Uh, it is said that the opposition in Iran la lacks organization and structure. Do you think that's a fair comment? How big a problem do you think that is? And what do you think can help bring organization and structure to the opposition uh, in Iran? Uh, as I said, it has a, a number of components. First and foremost is the ability to organize, and that cannot happen with some degree of structure, which depends a lot on communication and ability to disperse information both at home and abroad and be able to establish that dialogue. So any uh, assistance given in terms of technology, in terms of access, in terms of uh, not allowing the regime to uh, disrupt and or curb such communication will be of vital importance. I remember a couple of months ago, I was talking to somebody who was a, an expert in terms of, you know, what can be done in terms of, uh, for instance, internet access. And at some point, the issue of a company like Google came up and the fact that they can, in fact, circumvent the regime's attempts to, to, uh, to bar, you know, uh, access to the internet by a satellite and what have you. Uh, and the problem was really with the legal department of that company saying, hey, we cannot do that because it's in violation of our sanction policies. So I think these are the kind of things that will be helping us having better means uh, in terms of our activities. And organization in terms of political coordination is, of course, another aspect of how can we communicate those who are active outside with those who are active inside. And there are all sorts of different access depending on the point of focus of one particular group versus the other in terms of coordination and assistance to the current day, everyday actions that people are taking on the streets. To that extent, there's been some element of, 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 uh, of success. It's the next step that is more important. In other words, preparing the stage for transition. And that's the part where there has to be more of a tangible mechanism of representation, as diverse as possible of the secular democratic forces, both at home and abroad. So once this regime collapses, they can be familiar with the faces or the people or the groups that will be able to manage this transition. Clearly, one of the key questions is for those of us being su successful in uh, bringing about uh, a temporary uh, provisional government that will be in charge of two things. A, running the country temporarily for a couple of years while the whole process of constitutional debate goes on. And of course, prepare the stage for the first uh, available opportunity to conduct elections so that parliamentarians who will be charged with drafting the future constitution can in fact go about their job. It will take coordination and representation and collaboration of all these democratic forces to bring about that element. At this time, all I'm asking the democratic opposition 
is to find common projects of how they can assist and support the existing movement and actions that are happening in Iran today. But we ought to be thinking a little bit ahead of that as well, which is part of my conversations with most of them and saying at some point, you're gonna have to fill the void. And that cannot happen by accident. Uh, and that's part of the confidence level that people can have, that we don't have to start guessing. We need to have a better understanding of what can be the useful actors. And to that degree, the current intelligentsia within Iran, who has been suppressed or is a bit bashful or shy or timid about showing their face, will eventually find their moments. And I think most of the leadership we're talking about is going to come out of people who are faceless for now, but we know exist. Barbara? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara Slavin from the Atlantic Council. Very nice to see you again and appreciate your remarks. A um, couple of questions. Um, are you meeting with uh, officials in the Trump administration to talk about these goals uh, of yours at this point? Um, are you concerned that the sanctions policies put in effect by the Trump administration are actually hurting the ability of people to demand their rights because they're worried about everyday survival. And finally, you made a reference to assets that could be somehow seized and used for the opposition. Uh, it, it seems as though we have frozen every conceivable asset that Iran has in this country. So what are you referring to? Thank you. Well, I, but it's here or abroad, there's yet many other aspects of, of such assets that I think can be uh, Salvage. I don't have the details for you. I would be happy to get back to you on it uh, from our um, experts. But um, uh, one thing you said, I have yet to have any meeting with any member of the current administration on the executive side. I have had throughout the years uh, communicated uh, uh, our ideas uh, with uh, members of Congress, uh, both on the House and Senate. Uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, it's important that uh, the core group of legislators in this country, backed by public opinion, uh, be more persuasive of anybody in a position of decision making in this country as to which direction the policy should be aimed at. Uh, I think there are many more people around the world, including Americans that I talk to, that realize that the silent cry of the Iranian people have, it's about time that it, it is heeded. And, until now, there's been really a limited uh, attitude, not just of the American governments, irrespective of who was in the White House, but the West in general. And a lot of it, I think, is based, was, has been based on this false premise of expecting behavior change by a regime that its DNA simply doesn't allow it to change its behavior. If they were stopping to do what they do, they would no longer be the Islamic regime. And as such, everything that followed 40 years of the Islamic regime was based on the false expectation that we can perhaps persuade them through diplomacy to come to their senses and reach a state of compromise. Now we have come to a stage where the system is about to implode. People are on the streets. It's no longer acceptable. We cannot just hope to obtain different results by following uh, the same process. Something has to change. And in that case, dialogue is very important. And that's all I'm asking for, an opportunity for decision makers to talk to those of us who can, in fact, explain where we think they could be uh, impactful, where it could be helpful, uh, in order to bring about uh, the change that we are hoping to achieve in Iran. Um, um, if the administration is prepared to talk, that's great. We welcome the opportunity. Uh, and I would be happy to uh, uh, offer as many opinions as I can as to who I think this administration should be talking to, both inside Iran and outside Iran beyond the regime and its representative. The impact of the sanctions. Yeah. The impact of the sanctions uh, again, um, if the objective of the sanctions is behavior change, as opposed to ultimately regime change, it's two different approaches altogether. And I will throw in their smart sanctions, targeted sanctions. Uh, the sanctions overall has affected the regime, of course, but it has also heavily affected the Iranian people. And people at this time say, how long do you expect us to tighten the belt if you're still talking to our oppressors, as opposed to help us get rid of them altogether? How about targeting more SEPA and the leadership? How about the, the, the personal assets and bank accounts of the current leadership? That's where they will say, ouch. 
and go after the kind of uh, assets that are still uh, available to them, but not to the Iranian people, or for that matter, the opposition. Uh, you know, this, these are issues that need to be discussed and, and, and sought. Where is it that a modification of certain policies will bypass issues that limit us to do anything? Uh, I'll give you another example because of the sanction policies. Let's say you want to send money to Iran. That's not an easy thing to do. If you want to uh, register an organization, the minute the word Iran came to the name, it's red flag. Transactions are stopped. These are the kind of things that penalizes dissidents more than it does the regime. Because often they've had found a way to circumvent that. Does that mean that sanctions are pointless? No. But I will add to the fact that until now, sanctions were imposed with the intention of behavior change. And no political leader has yet to come in America, in Europe, or elsewhere to say, yes, we want to see regime change in Iran. Not by our doing, but by helping the Iranian people make that decision. You cannot come and say we support the Iranian people, but we don't want regime change. How the hell do you want us to get to democracy while this regime is still in place? That's a little bit a contradiction. So I think not just the rhetoric, but also the actual uh, revision of some policies could certainly uh, uh, work out some of the problems we have in there, and maybe some other ideas that could be added to the pot. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I wonder if uh, I could ask you to be a bit more explicit. Would you please introduce yourself? I'm sorry, Alan Gerson, AG International Law. I wonder if I might ask you to be a bit more explicit in how you envision the scenario, which I assume is a scenario of a bloodless revolution. You've talked about uh, the United States officially saying that they endorse regime change, uh, more, more um, targeted sanctions, but can you tell us a little bit more how, this, how you envision this actually coming about? And just as a follow-up question, because you spent a lot of time saying that your role was to try to bring the disparate elements together, can you tell us about your assessment of the MEK and whether that's part of the problem or part of the solution? Well, uh, I'll answer the second part of your question first. Uh, the continuing problem we have, or you can see with the MEK, is that they have yet to agree to work with democratic forces. Why? You should ask them. Maybe it's because uh, by doing so, they will lose the integrity and the control of their structure. Um, the policy should be one of supporting a democratic process. I don't think that any political organization in any country will benefit by being labeled or brandished by any foreign government. That goes without saying. And this is not what we're asking either. We're simply saying that the foreign policy of what we hope would be that of the United States and, and its Western allies, its democratic allies, would be to say, we would support a process of democratic elections in Iran whereby the Iranian people can, in fact, achieve self-determination, and we will respect the outcome of their choice. That would be something that would be welcomed by every element within the political prison of Iran who are not with the regime. Um, it is important because they realize, my fellow compatriots, that until now, the regime has always tried to sandwich them from the rest of the world by putting themselves Please. in between. And that we have actually seen meaningful change occur when there was a direct engagement with dissidents and political actors inside and abroad when change occurred in different countries. I don't think the Iranian people expect any less nor any more. Uh, just doing this, by the way, will be a, a huge sea change by what many of my competitors have seen until now. Um, and their message through me or without me, as I said, I invite you to go and, uh, you know, uh, study it on your own, um, is an expectation of a prise de position, as the French will say, that we want you to say, do more than just say, we support the Iranian people and their democratic aspirations. Well, what exactly are you doing about it? Uh, these are the questions that people inside Iran ask. They want to have more element of, of tacit support, whether it being engaging with, uh, with the civil society within Iran by trying to bring more uh, 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 sort of uh, 
uh, logistical support, whatever you want to call it, so that we can in fact implement a variety of actions that need to happen within Iran and will help bring in a peaceful transition. The key word is minimizing the cost of change to the Iranian people. That has been my philosophy. It's not change at any cost. And most importantly, I have yet to see a scenario of change leading to a democratic outcome by means of violence. Usually we see one form of dictatorship replacing the previous one. No, this time we are absolutely transparent about it and we want to make sure that the Iranians understand that they have maximum degree of empowerment so that they can be the decision maker and the final arbiter. And that requires a more engaged approach and, and actual elements of support. Uh, the, the, the dissecting of exactly what should be exactly the subject of discussions and ideas that can be shared with our counterparts in the free world as to exactly how they can help us do that, both in this phase, during the transition phase, and in the long run. No, no. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Shah Sadeh, Behnam Talablu from FDD. Um, one of the big differences from 78, 79 to now is that uh, the security forces were loyal and cohesive now, and they weren't necessarily then. Um, you said you were messaging to the security forces. What else besides messaging can peel them away? And what, what do you envision can entice them? Because 2019, 2020, as the sanctions pressure grows, their loyalty is going to be put to the test. Will they fire on their compatriots? Will they shoot their fellow citizens if they're not getting paid? What else would entice them not to do that besides not having a paycheck? Perhaps Truth and Reconciliation Commission? What else is out there? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, understanding that it doesn't suffice for only some of us uh, preaching the necessity for national reconciliation and amnesty. I think this has to be a policy adopted by the majority of our citizens to understand that sometimes as hard as it is to swallow your pride and the pain that you had to endure because of violation of your rights or how much harm has been done personally to one's uh, family or others, that in the best interest of the nation, at some point a reconciliation and compromise in terms of agreeing to be not vengeful, but put an end to the cycle of violence is ultimately not only important in bringing an atmosphere of, of, of stability, because I think the most important element that any citizens anywhere in the world will first ask for is I want to have personal security for my life and my assets. And if there is a climate of uncertainty and instability and disorder, doesn't matter how many democratic forces you have at play, that won't change. And we cannot achieve this transition without trying to get the majority of these elements on our side. And these people understand that at this point, many of them who have not necessarily been criminally involved in this repression, but are not seen from, uh, with a good eye by many of the people. Uh, and they want to have a guarantee of survival beyond the regime. That's very critical. That's, that's what you know, I talk about with them and with the people, trying to convince both sides that you have to work together here. People have to send signals to, let's say, the Basijis or the Postars, and vice versa, that we can stand together as opposed to continue being versus each other. Let's not forget one thing. It's only the top echelon of these sort of mafia-like uh, paramilitary organizations that benefit from the continuation of this regime. But the majority of elements within the Basij or Sepa are not necessarily benefiting. Some of them have to work secondary jobs. They're not getting paid enough to do the dirty work on top of it. So there is a breaking point. And as we speak, especially in a few last months, I had, as I said, more and more communications coming from me from fairly highly situated in terms of rank elements that are saying these messages that we want to be able to be part of this solution. What do we need to do? How can you communicate the fact that we want to be with the people? And the same thing that I say to the people, you have to send respectively your signals to these elements that 
We're not here to get you or to take revenge upon you. We want to have a peaceful transition. Yes, the criminals will have to account for one day in a court of law. But the majority of these people cannot be held directly responsible for having committed a crime or simply because they had to follow up orders. It's not an easy proposition. It's always easy to be emotionally uh, sometimes uh, driven. But I think a certain degree of rationality and deeper thinking prevails that it takes so many of us to guarantee that there is going to be a controlled outcome by each playing our respective roles. We are in a mode of defiance right now. But as soon as the regime collapses, we're talking about reconciliation. And reconciliation is very important because uh, as long as people have faith in their system, as long as people know that are truly represented, as long as people know that the law of the land would guarantee your rights, then you have the highest degree of incentive to serve your country. The opposite, of course, exists. But in order to get there, we can't simply say, we're going to close our eyes, open our eyes, and hey, all of a sudden we have a different system. No, we have to work it. And this collaboration, this dialogue, is what is happening as we speak. And right now, the grassroots are ahead of the game, to be honest with you. I think the streets of Iran are, are way ahead of the game insofar as the diaspora, insofar as the opposition, insofar as the intelligentsia is concerned. But the intelligentsia is now starting to catch up to them. And so the time will come that the majority of the various actors to each have to play their part in this transition are going to show up. We are beginning to work this issue. Yes, it is crucially important at this stage for those who are involved in political guidance and organization to make sure that while they work on common uh, uh, projects to address today's immediate need of what do we do now, between now until the regime ultimately implodes or collapses, but also to think what will happen right then and after that. How do we work the transition? As I said earlier, how do we propose the mechanisms that will be representative of that transition so we can include as much participation and shared while divided responsibilities about various actors and players inside and outside Iran. This is going to be an ongoing process. God knows how long between now and the collapse of the regime or how many months after uh, the transition. But I'm confident that we are not going to, in most cases, reinvent the wheel. We're going to use a variety of models. We're going to think of, for instance, an uh, example of specific institutions that have done work and research. There's an organization in Sweden, for instance, called IDEA, that have studied how do you, uh, uh, for instance, deal with exactly the subjects we're talking about, the reintegration of paramilitary forces in a post-dictatorial regime to the benefit of a newly democratic system. These are things that have been studied and researched that exist that we can use as guidelines, uh, suggested models to implement in our country. Or for instance, what happens during the transition insofar as until we finally have a secular democratic order, people will die, there will be divorces, there will be marriage settlements, there will be inheritance. Are we going to use the Islamic Republic laws or are we going to find other means of dealing with that during the transition? There are so many questions like this that comes into mind that we need to, of course, address. So it's, it's quite a complex proposition, come to think of it. But back to your question that is really critical, yes, I think that what will bring down the cost of change and a certain degree of confidence, not just for people not to face an obstacle during change, but a guarantee of more stability and order after the change, is the implicit participation and collaboration of the existing military and par paramilitary structures in Iran, without which our job will be much harder. Let's have one more question. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a privilege to hear you always. Um, Please I'm Mar introduce yourself. Yeah. Maryam Memar Sadri from Tavana. Uh, my question is about the potential for chaos and anarchy that you've described and, and ways to prevent that, which you've spoken about 
extensively. Um, specifically about American civic institutions. How can they be more helpful? What can we do to make them more helpful? During the fall of communism, the AFL-CIO was intimately connected to Solidarity, American Federation for Teachers. Um, for that matter, during the 1979 revolution, American, all kinds of Americans, ordinary Americans, were very much in tune with the with the revolution. Why aren't they now? What are we doing wrong that American civic institutions don't feel like Iranian teachers are their brothers and sisters? Thank you. Well, I, first of all, that's exactly one of the key issues that you mentioned practically can happen is the solidarity of all sorts of world bodies and organization in solidarity with Iranian people. You mentioned labor forces, absolutely. Right now, as we speak, it's the most prominent example of defiance and demonstrations and strikes that is going on. For at least it has been going on for almost a year now. And yes, I think there will be a, a tremendous boost of not only morale, but beyond that even tangible support that we can uh, hope uh, such organizations, uh, especially labor union, could uh, demonstrate in becoming more uh, vocal or active in, uh, in trying to do what they can in support of, of Iran. But again, as I said, Perhaps part of the reason where there's a limit to what can be done is the obstacle that the current sanction policies uh, have created for the inability to, in fact, do something. Uh, and that's why I think that, uh, uh, you know, until we see some uh, significant change in something that will uh, keep the bad guys at bay but help the good guys do their job uh, needs to be rectified. And until then, uh, I think that we will see not much done, practically speaking, beyond just some verbal or moral support. Maybe that's one way to solve some of the problems so that such organizations worldwide could in fact be more engaged with helping uh, Iranian civil society and for that matter NGOs and what have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the, there is a... Please share and like. See you next clip.